This research is based on um, my book project on the process of uh, politics and nation building in, in China. Um, when we think about the, the cases of, of ethnic politics in China, and often people talk about the, uh, the failures of the Chinese state in terms of uh, consolidating its, its national identity project uh, with regard to the Tibetans and, and the Uyghurs. Um, and these two basically are the ones that have been, particularly in the past few years, we have seen uh, active cases of resistance towards the Chinese state. Um, so, for example, you know, I mean, 2008, those protests in Tibetan uh, regions in China, but also more violent uh, cases of, of, of protest um, <coughs> in Xinjiang among the Uyghurs. So, I mean, if you follow international news, you find many cases of, of, of those kind of uh, more violent resistance, uh, particularly from the Uyghurs. So the, the question that I, I want to explore is that, um, you know, yes, we have these two cases of ethnic groups have been resisting actively the Chinese state control. However, empirically speaking, China is a multi-ethnic country and it has more than um, 50 other ethnic groups uh, who are categorized as, mi as minorities in, in, in the PRC. So the question is, why it's only these two, uh, Tibetans and Uyghurs, but not the other ones have been resisting in the same way towards Chinese state? So in that case, we can see actually quite a lot of variations in terms of responses of different ethnic groups in their strategies dealing with Chinese state. So essentially the question I ask is that, you know, um, of the uh, 109 million uh, ethnic minority groups in, in China, why were some ethnic groups mobilized politically uh, against Chinese state while others have not done so? So in, in some ways, I'm going to explore this, this variation uh, across different groups. The theoretical <laughs> argument um, I put forward um, essentially looking at two elements. The first one is, is looking at this sort of preference formation process on part of a, a particular ethnic group. And the argument essentially is this, that usually um, a group's perceptions of their, uh, the welfare of within a particular state in some ways is dependent upon the comparison. This comparison uh, often can be done th through a framework between themselves and a reference group. And this refer reference group often can be the external kin relations of a particular ethnic group. So the argument is that if you perceive that your external king relations having a better re uh, deal than, than you have, um, and then you are likely to develop grievances towards the, whole, the state that you currently inhabit. On the other hand, if you think yourself actually are doing better than your external king groups, and then um, they are actually more, the group are more likely to be content with their current situation. Um, the other aspect is looking at um, the, the, the resource mobilization aspect. So we have talked about this grievance construction, right? So a group, a group can develop discontent towards a particular state. But this grievance alone usually is not enough to be translated into political action. Um, you know, there are lots of people who have a grievance towards uh, the political authority, but only a few would take action. So in order to take action, you need resources, you need networks, you need mobilization. Um, so these often come through the channel of, of, of support. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at the presence of a tangible external support. So when we think about external support in terms of its effect on political mobilizations uh, throughout the world, um, usually we can look at three sources. And big powers particularly have their uh, share of, um, um, in terms of try to mobilize different groups uh, on their behalf. During the Cold War period, um, the US and the US, uh, USSR um, both supported various ethnic rebel groups throughout the world. Um, even in this case, PRC, um, and PRC for example, actively supported the Burmese Communist Party in Burma and uh, destabilized quite a lot of, of much of the Southeast Asia through uh, communist par parties of various countries. Um, so in, in this case, we, we want, I want to look at whether there is a presence of big power support. The second one is a particular type of, of, of relations, um, the so-called king homeland countries. So this relates to a type of countries that 
usually claim itself as the homeland uh, protector for all the ethnic, other ethnic groups from this country. So for example, you can think of Turkey um, as the, you know, the, the claim, self-claimed homeland for Turkic populations throughout Central Asia. Or you can think of Hungary as the homeland country on behalf of the Hungarians living in, in, in Romania. So in, in, in this case, we can also think, think of, for example, the, the China, right? China, China also, in, in, in some cases, proclaim itself <coughs> as the homeland for all the ethnic Chinese throughout the world. So this is another element I will look at empirically, whether you have a presence of external king homeland support. Finally, the, the, uh, the third source of support can come from diaspora communities. So diaspora communities, um, and, um, particularly in, in the West, have played an active role in mobilizing politics back home. And we think about, for example, the, the Sri Lanka Civil War. The Tamil, um, Tamil diaspora in, in Canada and the US basically channeled a tremendous amount of money uh, to support the rebel group back home. And we can find many other cases of diaspora activities basically on its impact <coughs> on politics back at home. So I'll look at these three sources of big power uh, support, king homeland support, or diaspora community support. So essentially, if you put these two elements of uh, variables and arguments together, and then it come together with a um, two by two table, right? I mean, so um, on the top uh, left cell, so that you have a group that perceive that it's, it's the king is doing better than you, which means you already have grievance towards the state, and then you have support. And this is basically the case, I would argue, um, I'm more likely to have a national identity contestation. So this is the case, very more likely to have a political mobilization on this group, on, on behalf of this group. And if you have a better alternative, but without external support, and then I will argue this group will move out. Basically, you perceive <coughs> that your king is doing better, but then somehow there's not, nobody's come on your behalf, then you probably are likely to move out to the king country. Um, if neither of these variables are available, and essentially my argument is that the group is most likely to seek assimilation. And finally, on the left, uh, lower left cell, um, if a group does not perceive better alternative, somehow there are some elements of support coming, but then I think the group is more likely to settle for some level of cultural autonomy. So obviously this is a sort of theoretical framework, and empirically they might vary. So I'm going to talk about the, in the imperial cases from China, how they fit within this theoretical model. Um, so case selection, I look at ethnic groups in China over populate, population over a million, which means I'm looking at the relatively bigger groups. And um, geographically, um, they are located in distinct parts of Chinese territory. So I want to look at variations uh, across the Chinese uh, territory. And then I'll look at these vari va variations on these two independent variables in terms of comparative economic framework, but also the level of uh, whether the presence of external support. Um, so if you look at a Chinese case, um, basically of the um, groups over po have population over a million, you have 18 groups. And uh, incidentally, nine of, uh, nine of these 18 have external king relations. Um, so China um, is a country that shares a land border with 14 countries, which is the largest number of borders you can share. Uh, in the world, right? Same with Russia. Russia also shares a border with, 20, with 14 countries. So which means you have lots of groups, what is bo borders are uh, artificial, right? They came later on than, than people. So, so obviously many of those people living across this territory and later on border were decided and then many groups basically were demarcated across different territories. So out of these nine groups on the, on the, on the right hand side, I basically I will, I will look at <coughs> five of them. So they are the, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, Mongols in Mongolia, the Koreans in, in Yanbian uh, in, in northeast China, and Da in, in Sichuan Banna, Sichuan Banna in, in, in Yunnan, and, and Tibetans in, in, in Tibet. So this is a map distribution of the five groups, and so it pretty much across the, 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 the Chinese periphery um, on um, northeast, north, and west, and south, southwest, no, southwest. All right, so the empirical cases. The first one I want to talk about is the, the Korean case. And this is actually the one that fits very well with the theoretical framework that I just talked about. 
Um, so there are about 2 million uh, Koreans living in China. Um, they are often called Chosenjo, right? Um, usually they're living <coughs> across the border from North Korea. Um, and for the Chinese Koreans, um, they were essentially descendants from migrants from, from, from the Korean Peninsula as a result of Japanese colonization of Korea. So they basically Japan pushed out many peasants uh, into, into China. So many of them later on settled in Northeast China and later on became Chinese citizens. Um, and obviously for, for the Chinese chosen job, um, these days they have two external king state, right? You have uh, both North Korea and also South Korea as, as external king, king state countries. And then, however, you see a very clear better alternative in this case, that is South Korea. Uh, South Korea has, um, you know, uh, economic prosperity, basically more wealth than uh, is richer uh, than China, and then also it's, uh, as, uh, it's a democratic country. Um, on the other hand, you have North Korea, which is the opposite of South Korea in a way that you have poverty uh, and dictatorship. Right. So, so the, in this case, basically, we have very clear sort of alternative that is basically South Korea. However, this alternative, uh, better alternative in South Korea doesn't really mean that South Korean government is interested in supporting Chinese Koreans. And in fact, um, the, the South Korean government has intentionally tried to limit uh, its scope of, of, of support to, towards the Chinese uh, Koreans. So um, the recent years, um, the South Korean government passed a Overseas Korean Act, which essentially uh, uh, gives um, sort of citizenship uh, benefits to ethnic Koreans living overseas. But one of the conditions is that you have to be, uh, your, you and your, your sisters have to be citizens of, of uh, ROK since 1948. So which means that all the Chinese Koreans usually they're not suitable for these benefits because they migrate out of Korea much earlier than that. Um, on the other hand, basically you have North Koreans still pushing out uh, those refugees uh, to, to China. So essentially that is not neither of these external king homeland countries are willing to support the Chinese Koreans. So as predicted, for example, as, as I said in, in a theoretical framework, that this, this is a group that you have a clear alternative but no support. And then it's very likely this group is, is going to move out. Right? And this is essentially what happened. Um, basically, um, emigration to South Korea uh, during the past 20 years um, has been going on. Uh, a, estimates about 20 to 30 percent of Chinese Koreans have already migrated out to South Korea, either permanently or, or non-permanently. Um, and this is also a migration that is, is heavily gendered, so which means that this proportional amount of Chinese Korean women uh, migrate out to South Korea, often through marriage. Um, during uh, the Qing Dae-jung period in the mid-1990s, um, because of the shortage of, of, of brides in, in South Korean countryside, uh, the South Korean government uh, carried out a matchmaking project in, in, in uh, Northeast China to recruit uh, Chinese Korean women uh, uh, for marriage in South Korea because of the p emphasis on racial purity uh, from the South Korean government. So many of those women uh, from, from, from Northeast China basically married into uh, rural South Korean households. So which means that this, this migration is very gendered. Essentially, more women have a much more uh, opportunity more likely to be uh, to emigrate out to South Korea than men. And then there's also a big wave of, of illegal immigrants, um, which means that people, for example, they go to South Korea as tourists or, and they overstay and then work in, in, in restaurants, etc., or construction. So that's one wave of migration, particularly to South Korea. Um, th th then there's also another wave of migration, which is internal to China, but then still related to South Korea. <coughs> This basically means that there's a, a also a large wave of migration of, of, of Chinese Koreans from northeast China to coastal cities in, in, along, uh, in, in South China, where you have sizable South Korean investment and, 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 and student communities. So like in Beijing, for example, like Wangjing is, is the area that you have a very large uh, uh, South Korean community. And then usually people who work for those communities, such as restaurants, like all the Korean restaurants in China are operated by the, South, uh, by the Chinese Koreans. Um, uh, things like that. They provide a lot of services for, for the Chi South Korean communities in, in China. So the result of that is, is a depopulation of the uh, traditional Chinese Korean communities in, in Northeast China. So the, 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 
So on the one hand, you have many uh, women basically migrate out, right? So, um, so which means <coughs> the merit, the, the how should I say, the, um, there is a shortage of, of women uh, in, in particular uh, Ch Chinese Korean communities in Northeast uh, China. On the other hand, uh, because of the migration, uh, emigration, um, uh, local school system is no longer able to afford uh, to uh, s sustain themselves uh, because of the shortage of, of students, etc. <coughs> so the traditional Korean school system is, is, is actually uh, increasingly becoming uh, difficult to operate. Um, on the other hand, though, um, this inter interaction with external you know, king group somehow produced a very interesting ambiguity, uh, ambiguous understanding of, of national belonging. And this is essentially um, sort of, um, how should I say, many anthropologists like, you know, Frederick Bath talk about this encountering, that you become who you are after you encounter somebody else, right? So, so the result of that encountering with external you know, king group here essentially means that um, how should I say, um, uh, the, the common saying is that you, you realize you are Chinese when you're in Seoul for a Chinese Korean. So it essentially means that, that when they actively interact with South Koreans, in some ways reinforce their nationality being Chinese. Um, and this obviously also has to do with discriminations that the Chinese Koreans face when they are in South Korea. Um, so all things together, um, these days you can talk about very ambiguous sort of uh, understandings of national and ethnic belonging uh, among the Chinese Koreans. So this is a questionnaire I carried out uh, in, in, in Yanbian. And obviously you can see the numbers that um, more, than <coughs> more than half of, uh, of, of, the, of the people have relatives living in, in, in North Korea, but also particularly in South Korea, that you have people working in South Korea, more than 80%. Um, but somehow, many of those people interviewed, they tend to agree they are some sort of Chinese citizens. And then I would argue this possibly is a false positive uh, re result, <coughs> meaning that the people who don't want to be associated with China have already moved out, right? So it's, it's actually the ones who stayed for a reason. They think probably it's fine with living in China. So that's probably the reason why there's a very high percentage of people reported uh, uh, themselves as Chinese citizens. Um, and um, similarly, basically, you, you can see the, the, the patterns of identification uh, with other careers, also with China. You can see quite lots of ambiguities in some ways that people uh, tend to be uh, comfortable with both in the sense that um, they can be ethnic Koreans but also be citizens of China. So this is a case that we do not see much political active, uh, uh, active mobilization uh, among the Chinese Koreans. Essentially, the group moved out. So the second case uh, I'm going to talk about is, is the Uyghur case. And this is the one that um, obviously have generated a tremendous amount of international attention, right? Um, not only through, I mean, today, for example, is, is the trial of, of uh, <coughs> Ikman Toti, right, in, in, uh, in, in Ulumuchi. And a few days ago, there was uh, Indonesia also arrested uh, four uh, Uyghur uh, in Indonesia as part of the ISIS uh, whatever, right? So, which means this, this group has uh, lots of international attention, either because of the human rights situations in China, but also because of its uh, allegedly uh, uh, alleged uh, connections with uh, terrorist uh, organizations. So, the the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, it's it's one of the largest uh, Muslim groups in, in in China in the north e northwest uh, territory, and uh, and historically, it, sh it shared a strong. <coughs> religious and cultural relations um, with Turkic Central Asia. And so the, you know, we can talk about like East Turkestan or uh, West Turkestan, which is basically the Soviet Turkestan. <coughs> and during the Qing period, uh, when, when Britain and, and Russia were going around with big games, and then you have the Chinese Turkestan, which is Xinjiang today, and then you have the Russian Turkestan, which is the, 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 the Russian, you know, Central Asian countries. And historically, particularly during, during since the early 20th century, you have very clear alternative of better mo model development in Soviet Central Asia. Um, and this relates to the Soviet Union, despite the fact that later on, you know, Soviet Union would, would collapse and, and, and would, you know, no longer in, in, in existence. But uh, in the early half of the 20th century, Soviet Union was, was was a beacon of modernity uh, in, in that part of the world, right? And particularly, think about communism, Leninism, uh, 
I mean, like China was a receptor for, for these kind of ideologies, considered as modern ideologies. And, and so essentially for many of the Uyghur elites uh, in the 1930s, um, <coughs> many of them would be educated in, in universities in, in Central Asia, uh, in, in Soviet Central Asia. So at the time, basically, you have a very clear case of, of, of mod modernity development in Soviet Central Asia versus China. And, and contemporarily, uh, even though we say um, <coughs> China's economy has gone up quite a lot, however, um, poverty and lack of economic development still characterize much of the Uyghur popular areas. Um, so for example, um, if you look at this average uh, um, so GDP per capita, PPP, um, which is fine, right? So like $4,000, which is 2004. So currently perhaps would double that, right? Uh, in Xinjiang average. <coughs> However, if you look at this correlation between Uyghur populated areas and economic development, you see a very, how should I say, um, rev uh, high correlation of, of you know, you know Kotan and Kashka, more than 90% of the populations are Uyghurs and they're actually the poorest regions in, in, in Xinjiang. So which means that um, you know, economic disparity <coughs> is actually heavily associated with, with ethnic division, right? And that's actually one of the common argument essentially is that even though you have uh, fast economic development in, 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 in Xinjiang, but then those benefits hasn't really translated into uh, a more equitable distribution of wealth. Uh, and which is also divided by ethnic uh, uh, communities, particularly the Uyghurs. Um, so, so which means that you have uh, historically, but also contemporarily, a, a better alternative of, of, of development um, in, 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 in Soviet Central Asia, but also later on uh, in, in Turkic Central Asia. But this is also a case that have a historically a tremendous amount of support for, for the Uyghurs uh, nationalist uh, project. And this also showed up with, with the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union um, actively supported the East Turkestan Republic, uh, the second one, and since 1944. Um, in 1947, uh, basically the Soviet Union provided um, um, military personnel and financial support <coughs> for the ETR. And in 1947, after signing of the, the Sino-Soviet uh, Friendship uh, tr Treaty with Nanjing government, and they basically, Soviet Union forced the ETR to form a coalition government with Nanjing. And after PRC was founded, basically Soviet Union essentially forced uh, the ETR to be absorbed by, by, the, by, by, by the PRC. So the PLA entered, entered Xinjiang relatively peacefully, which because it was, it was you know, absorbed by the PRC through an external pressure from the Soviet Union, right? So different from the Tibetan case that we'll talk about, you know, military coercion were used uh, you know, significantly in the Tibetan case, but in the Xinjiang case, it was not that. Um, however, after the Sino-Soviet Sino -Sino split in the early, 20, early 1960s, and then you have cases of active so Soviet sabotage uh, of, of Xinjiang. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, sort of access of, of, of Uyghurs and, and, and Kazakhs to Soviet Central Asia, but also throughout the Cultural Revolution period, 60s, 70s, Soviet Union carried out tremendous propaganda <coughs> towards Xinjiang, um, basically inciting Uyghur nationalist uh, resistance towards the Chinese state. Um, on the other hand as well, that Turkic countries such as Turkey and also later on the Central Asian republics played a tremendous role in terms of uh, uh, sort of supporting the, the, the Uyghur uh, mobilization project. And especially in, in, since the 1990s. So if you look at the data of, of uh, ethnic uh, rebellion in, in, in Xinjiang, and you find the 1990s is actually a period have a big spike of a reported accidents of, of violence. Um, and this perhaps has to do with the independence of the five Central Asian republics, right? So on the one hand, we can think of uh, as uh, ideational, inspirational support, right? So ideations, ideology, and um, that, so because the, the, you know, the Kazakhs now have Kazakhstan and the, the Kyrgyz has Kyrgyzstan, it's probably time for the Uyghurs to have its Uyghurstan. So ideologically, uh, ideologically speaking, there's lots of inspiration coming from Soviet Central Asia. On the other hand, um, the two of the Central Asian republics after they got independence, uh, the, you know, uh, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan had a brief civil war in the in, in, in early 1990s. So at a time, some of the, the military uh, weapons, et cetera, were also sort of uh, came through um, 
the Chinese side. So that's also one of the reason why you have a spike of, uh, of, of incidents of uh, mobilization in Xinjiang in the 1990s. And on the other hand, uh, increasingly so, these days we have an active diaspora community uh, uh, in, in the West, um, particularly in, in, in the US, but also in, in, in Germany. Um, so, um, so this basically is, is, is a case that you, know, you have a sort of a historical uh, perceptions of a better alternative in Soviet, uh, in Central Asia, um, but also historically it is a case with active support uh, from all sources, uh, from the big power, uh, from the external king, home, king, uh, king homeland countries, but also from its diaspora communities in, in the West. Um, the third case I'm going to talk about is the Tibetan one. Um, and this is also, despite its, its, its harsh as international uh, fame, um, um, there are tremendous amount of uh, uh, controversy and plots involved with the Tibetan case uh, in its uh, self-determination and, uh, uh, and, and resistance towards the Chinese state. So, and I'll talk about Tibetan case, how it actually also fits with the one that talk about this sort of external element uh, in terms of uh, its relations with, with Beijing. Um, and here I, I will specifically focus on two critical junctions uh, in junctures of uh, Tibetan, modern Tibetan re history um, with regard to China. That is basically, the first is with regard to China's annexation of Tibet in 1951. 1951. Um, and the second one is basically about the revolt in 59 that led to the exile of, of Dalai Lama into India. Um, so the, the first one I want to talk about is this better alternative argument. Now, so the Tibetan government in 1950, um, so Mao, um, so the PLA essentially sort of liberated out, uh, liberated um, you know, the, 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 the much of the, the PRC. And, and so the PLA actually went to Tibet, basically uh, defeated Tibetan government troops in, in Chamdo and then stopped. And so Mao basically sent an ultimatum to Lhasa government and asked them to uh, surrender, right? And so from, from Mao's point of view, he did not want to, he, he actually wanted to achieve a peaceful solution for the Tibetan question. So, so that basically means that he does not want to use military force, even though it can, but he wants to use a, a, a negotiation process to, to, to subdue the Tibetan government at the time. So there are a lot of discussions within t Tibetan parliament at the time whether they want to be associated with China. So, the, the, at the time, tremendous amount of uh, voices within the, uh, the monastic class is, 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 is not to be, not want to be part of China. And this basically draws f on the lessons of Mongolia. So the, the, the Tibetan theoretical, theocratic class in Mongolia was purged in the 1930s after Stalin's uh, purge of, of, of uh, revolution in, in, in Mongolia. So because of that presence, and basically the Tibetan theocratic state uh, has a um, aversion to the communist party. Basically it is considered as an enemy of religion. So that's one reason they did not really want to be part of, of China. The second one is economically speaking, is that Tibet at the time was much more closely in t related, linked to, to India than to China. So uh, one good example of that is that in 1951, when the PLA entered t Tibet, um, so in order to support, to feed the troops, the soldiers, right, you need to feed them, you need to find food for them. Um, but Tibet, Tibet itself cannot really produce those food. So they have to ship uh, rice and other things uh, to Tibet. So the, the way they did it actually was, you know, the, the rice have to be shipped from Hong Kong to Kakata and then shipped up to Tibet. Because the, 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 the highways, um, you know, currently we talk about the Qinghai and the, you know, the Sichuan highways, the roads haven't, have, have not really been built yet. So which means that historically at, at that period, uh, it's much more economic link with India than, than with China. Uh, it might take you caravans <coughs> probably months to, tra to, to ship those, those, those goods to Tibet than actually ship it from, from Indian side. So, so that is bad alternative in, 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 this, ca in this case. So, so, the, so I'm, I want to focus on, uh, on that period. So you have a uh, military you know, um, <coughs> battle and the Tibetan side got defeated, right? So the Mao basically sent a delegation uh, to, to, to New Delhi to negotiate uh, with, Tibet, with Tibetan delegations in, in, in Delhi. So 
So, so the Tibetan side actually actively tried to support, tried to get support from the Indian government and the UK government and also the US. Um, so the, however, at the time um, when Nehru government um, was much more interested in establishing uh, close relations with, with China uh, as part of the South-South cooperation thing. And UK also considered that um, the government of India's position should take priority, so which means UK are going to follow the lead of, of, of India. And then US cannot specifically overtly support Tibetans because the UK and India was not, was not interested in supporting Tibetan case. So, so at the time, basically, the, 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 the effort to seek some support was not successful because the Austrian government uh, embassy declined to offer support for the Tibetan government. And also at the time, basically, you have at the, the start of the Korean War, right? And then, and in fact, uh, the UN actually condemned China for, for military aggression in Korea. And that's because the People's Voluntary Army entered, the South, uh, entered the Korea. So th there was actually UN condemnation of Chinese military aggression. So the Tibetan side also think this can be a good precedence because you know, this can be a, another case of military aggression by, by China in Tibet. So they sent a, de sent a delegation to, uh, uh, of, uh, to appeal to the United, uh, at, the, at the UN <coughs> in 1950. So as uh, same as the, the pre previous case of, of seeking support in, in, in India uh, and failed, and this same appeal in the UN in 1950 also failed uh, because of the, 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 the lack of interest of support from India and the UK and, and the US. So because of this, this, this effort, try to get the external powers behind the Tibetan government was not successful. That's the reason why the Dalai Lama government sent Ngapo's de delegation to Beijing to sign a 17-point agreement, right? So because otherwise they, are not, they, they were not interested in signing this agreement because these alternatives were not there, so they have to sign this agreement, otherwise um, you know, they, they will be militarily uh, uh, annihilated. So, so this is basically uh, meaning that at these critical junctions, uh, uh, junctures of modern Tibetan history, by signing this 17-point agreement, I mean, this is, only, this is the only group that has a piece of document basically you know, laid out its responsibilities and, 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 the, and the rights, et cetera, within the Chinese uh, situation. Right? Um, so, so that's basically the, the first part. I think that you can see the external element is tremendously uh, crucial. The second one is basically with regard to the revolt in 59. So obviously, the, the, the rebellions in, in Kampa area started early on in the in, in 1950s. Um, but the, what, what really deferred um, the, the, the late, uh, late part of 1950s from the early 1950s was the change of, 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 of strategies um, from the American side, and which has to do with domestic U.S. politics at a time when you have a, the McCarthy and, and anti-communism become much more of a foreign policy goal than basically Americans are much more interested in, in, in throwing a lot behind the Tibetans. So, since the mid-1950s, CIA started to get involved with the Kampa rebellions and then basically um, the revolt in 59, according to different sources, um, the, the Americans were not necessarily in terms of, um, how should I say, orchest orchestrating its revolt, but were actively part of, it, uh, of, of the revolt. So we can see that um, from the three cases I talked about, um, obviously the Korean case fits this, this <coughs> emigration uh, uh, very well then you have a better alternative, and then, but then without support. And this is essentially the group that moved out uh, to its, its you know, king uh, country. And with, with regard to the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, we also see the element of this um, better alternative, but also this uh, external support variables were, 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 um, were, were in play uh, with both cases. So this is certainly not um, a case, an argument, for example, try to diminish the, the crucial role of, of, of domestic politics uh, within the PRC, uh, for example, um, particularly during the, the, the 60s, 70s, in terms of uh, uh, persecuting uh, uh, minorities. Um, but the argument essentially that this, this persecution during the Cultural Revolution essentially uniform and uh, throughout Chinese territory. Right. But they somehow re achieve different kind of reactions from, from groups. Um, so 
So because of that, I argue we have to look at the variations on the external element, and that basically meaning that external factors are crucial in explaining some of the variations among different ethnic groups' response towards the Chinese nation building process. And this also means that the understandings of future <coughs> politics, uh, future of ethnic politics in, in, in China, have to pay attention to this external dimension. Um, and obviously, you know, we can think of the Tibetan question that um, it's not simply between the exile government and the Beijing government. I mean, there are a tremendous amount of stakes involved um, with various uh, governments in, in the world, um, around the world. So uh, with that, I, I will stop and then I will be happy to answer some of your questions. Thank you.